Hello, Richard. Hello, who's calling? <laughs> if you don't know by now, then something's gone very wrong. Well, what have you been doing? Again, have, you, have you been on the morning sauce again? <laughs> I haven't had time to be on the morning sauce. I've been mowing the lawn, Jamie. Well, congratulations. How are you? You, you should be doing something with your time. Uh, yes, and how are you? Everything all right? Yes, fine. Very busy. Uh, Good. I've had to... I've had to cancel the Space Centre, which is now in the past, just oh. which I feel really terrible about. But it's oh. for a very, very good reason, I promise. But is I will it? tell you after this call. Oh, 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 it's for my ears only, is it? It is. For, yeah. Oh, well, for, uh, now that's a sort of vaguely um, uh, Bond yes, title it is, thing. Yes. And do you know for who else was. For my ears only. In, <laughs> well, it was the audio version. Do you know who else was in quite a few Bond films as well as Anderson stuff? Uh, oh, quite a few Bond films as well as Amazon stuff. Um, well, oh, uh, uh, Mariam Darbo. <laughs> I mean, she was in an episode of Space Brief. Shane Rimmer! Shane, Shane Rimmer! Of course. Right, it's good to come to Shane Rimmer. Yeah, eventually. well, it's too late now. Yeah. Uh, well, I went to, to Shane Rimmer and he's going to be part of this podcast. Oh. It's very exciting. In fact... Yes. He didn't say Pod 15, right. so we're going to say Pod 15. OK. But shall we hand over to Shane to introduce the podcast? Oh, wow. Come on in, Shane. Here he is. Over to you, Shane. This is Shane Rimmer, and you are listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Pod 15, already, that's fantastic. Welcome, one and all, to Pod 15 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Uh, I'm Richard James. And I'm Jamie Anderson, and to celebrate our 15th episode-versary... Yes. (laughs) Yes. Shane Rimmer intro us. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, I'm going to skip straight ahead to the fact that because this coming weekend... Uh, it's International Thunderbirds Day, uh-huh. and more about that shortly. Great. Our guest interview is with the glorious Shane Rimmer, Scott Tracy himself. Amazing. It's a super long interview, so we're going to have to rattle through the usual Ooh. stuff to make sure we can squeeze it well, all in for our lovely listeners. Fair enough. Less of us and more of him. That sounds good. That's probably what they're hoping for. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. <laughs> now, you put a call out on Twitter, didn't you, a few days ago, saying if you've got any questions you'd like me to ask Shane, then uh, uh, do let me know. Did you get much response from that? Yeah, I got loads. I got Great. too many, in fact. Yeah. Uh, but I did ask him a few, so there's a quick fire round of those questions at the end of our session. Lovely. Um, and to those of you that missed it, I'm really sorry. I did tweet out and say, by midday. Yeah. So we had a couple of people that tweeted me like at six or seven in the evening yeah. and said, am I too late? I'm afraid you were. But I did all, them, all the ones I possibly could. Anyway, we've got all that, plus... Well, all the usual gubbins. We've got uh, listeners' gubbins. emails, of course. Gubbins is a lovely <laughs> word, isn't it? I think gubbins, isn't it? There's some sort of um, leg uh, dressing that they used to use in uh, the Raj in India. Is that, is that where well, it comes you from? Do the, you do the filling in and I'm going to look up the etymology Excellent. of gubbins. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have all the usual gubbins. That's the listeners' emails, of course. We love to hear from you. And you can get in touch with us uh, at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. We have some Jerry Anderson news from uh, around the world. Um, as well as your emails, I think we also have the odd uh, audio file as well, which we always love to hear. Uh, alongside that, we have a fantastic interview with Shane Rimmer, the one and only Shane Rimmer coming up a little later. And of course, where would we be without Chris Dale and his amazing randomizer? This is where Chris is sat down every week in front of a, a random episode from the Jerry Anderson series and uh, gives us his thoughts and comments. And I know that's a very popular uh, popular item amongst people out there. Uh, particularly did... with them. But well, Robert <laughs> Monk, actually. Did you see this on Twitter, Jamie? Uh, you're going where I was going. Yes, yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Do uh, carry on. <laughs> so uh, Robert Monk, yes, we know you're listening, uh, has a slight confession. Chris Dale, I'm very sorry. Robert Monk said on Twitter, guys, don't hate me, but I fell asleep during the randomizer. I mean, at least he lasted quite a while, didn't he? That's quite a way in from the last... Uh... Yeah, it's a very long way, and that was a long episode as well. So, you know, I, I, we, we should take full responsibility for exhausting yes, poor Robert absolutely. during our segment. And in no way is that a reflection on Chris Dale's sterling work for the podcast. Yeah. 
So if you're suffering from insomnia, then do f- fast forward to the last 20 <laughs> minutes of the podcast. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Oh, I'm you only can't joking. Say that. Well, they, they yeah. definitely won't fall asleep on this week's randomizer. I can tell you that. No, really. Oh, it's too exciting. Well, how do you know it's random, isn't it? Yeah, but I know, but I have to listen to it to know what to put in, don't I? So, of course, it, it's random in the past, but not in the future. Well, we're in danger of the whole edifice crumbling down around us, aren't we, if we carry on down Anyway, do you want to know about Gubbins? Yes, of course. Uh, so, it's actually from the old French, Gobon or Gobe. Yes. Meaning a piece. Oh! Um, uh, so, literally pieces, I suppose. Yes. Um, fragments, pairings, scraps. Yes. Um, that sort of stuff. I can't actually find this reference you were saying about... Cubbins. Um, no, that's right. The, about le- the, the, the le- branching. Mm. But, of course, uh, there is also the meaning, the uh, informal uh, British slang, yeah. silly person or fool. As well, I uh, think that's... So there yeah. we go, Richard. <laughs> we'll leave that there, shall we? Silly uh, gubbins. Uh, yes, you silly old gubbins. Um, <laughs> now, we always love it when you get in touch with us on Twitter. You can hashtag us on hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast. And a few people have been doing you uh, doing just that over the last uh, week or so. Paul Guest said, uh, for instance, the fantastic Jerry Anderson Podcast 13 and 14 has superb coverage of Firestorm behind the scenes along with the regular banter and frivolity. Highly recommended, says Paul. <laughs> those those are our nicknames, Richard. Frivol- Your banter and I'm frivolity. <laughs> it does sound like a sort of a middle-aged detective <laughs> duo, doesn't it, from sort yes. of ITV4 daytime TV. Coming soon on ITV4. <laughs> <laughs> the adventures of banter and frivolity. <laughs> it could uh, work. Well, here we are. Yes, I can, yeah, absolutely, I can see that happening. <laughs> Um, and of course, you can tag us, uh, 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 Richard N. James, or I'm Jamie Anderson, or uh, Jerry Anderson TV, or Jamie, tell us how we can find out more and follow all this stuff that's happening about Firestorm on the various social media sites. Um, well, I mean, I'm trying to put it everywhere possible. Yeah, yeah. I'm currently recommending that people subscribe to our YouTube channel because there'll be nice things there very soon. Um, YouTube.com slash Firestorm HQ. Right. We're also Firestorm HQ on Instagram and Facebook. Or if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's SF9 Firestorm, Sierra Foxtrot 9 Firestorm. Uh, nice. More on that later. Brilliant. Lots of you doing it this week. Don't forget to screenshot your uh, phone when you're listening to the podcast mm. and then post it on social, be that on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or wherever you like. Yes. Um, just to prove that you're actually listening. Yes, a few people did that. CJ McLaughlin has done just that. Uh, Jay and David and Carl Morris and uh, Robert Monk, Andrew Hyde, Craig Edmonds, among many others, did just that. It's a great way of letting people know that you are listening to us. Uh, makes it feel like it's worth getting out of bed every morning, doesn't it, Jamie, to do this? <laughs> Did you only just get out of bed to do this, Richard? Well, well no, you said you, you mowed the lawn. I did, you, yeah, I yeah, that's right. Not long it has been known, let me tell you that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Richard, we're, we know we're very lucky today because not only have we got Scott Tracy, but of course we've got our regular news announcer, Gordon Tracy. Oh, look, it's, like a, it's a family affair this week, isn't it? It is. Yeah, Shall we it. hand over to Gordon to introduce the next segment? Let's do just that. Here he is. Hi, Gordon Tracy speaking. It's time for the Jerry Anderson News. Stop the podcast, Richard. What have you done? Uh, What's happened? Yeah, slight confession uh, to make, uh, Jamie, to the people at home. Uh, Since you last heard my voice on this podcast... uh, my voice recorder ran out of batteries. It stopped recording. <laughs> and at what point did we make this discovery, Richard? When we'd finished the entire podcast, Jamie. Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. I suddenly looked right. and realised the batteries had run out about 15 minutes in. So <laughs> so we have reconvened. Um, mm, and actually, at some point later the same day. Yeah, and in the meantime, I don't know about you, Jamie, but I've taken my barbecue to the tip and had a whole packet of liquid short swords. Amazing. Um, I've not done that. I've had a load of calls. Um, but, uh, yeah. And yet, for the it. people at home, no time has passed at all. Bizarrely, no. And uh, so we're just here with the news, as if nothing's happened. And, <coughs> and I think it's such a smooth transition that nobody will ever know. Don't never know. So. Let's hear the news! Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got away with it. Part de. Yes, you definitely got away with it. Uh, right, Richard, there's loads of news. As ever. So I'm going to have to rattle through it as quickly as possible, and I'm going to take a big, deep breath to do so. Are you ready? Yeah, counting on you, Jamie. Go for it. OK, here we go. So at the end of this week, it's International Thunderbirds Day on the 30th of September. Yes. 
Isn't that exciting? It's very exciting. So it's, the, it's the second of this uh, now annual event. I guess it's now annual because it's the second one. Yeah. It's happened, uh, you know, every year yeah. for two years. Um, set up by ITV to celebrate the amazing legacy of classic Thunderbirds, uh, which was first transmitted 53 years ago on the 30th of September this year. Nice. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so there'll be some exclusive stuff happening, celebratory bits and pieces. But one of the main bits of activity that's happening that day and the following day... Yeah is a Thunderbirds marathon on Twitch. Do you know what Twitch is? I've heard of Twitch. Uh, you've heard of it, but I, I bet a lot of our listeners may have not heard of yeah. it, or if they have heard of it, they're not sure what it is. Yeah. Uh, it's a place where the young people go to watch videos. Well, that's why I've heard other. of it. And, of course, <laughs> yes, being a young person yourself. Uh, so, it, traditionally, it was for gaming. People would go and watch others play gaming games, uh, computer games, mm -hmm. so uh, something that's called eSports, mm -hmm. which is very popular, but Twitch is now uh, much more widely used. You may have uh, actually watched something on Twitch a little while ago. The BBC did Doctor Who on Twitch, where they showed all the yes, classic series. they did. Well, uh, ITV and Shout Factory are putting on a, a screening of all of the classic episodes, all 32 of the classic episodes of Thunderbirds, plus some extras, plus the three brand new Thunderbirds 1965 episodes. Oh! Uh, yeah, so if you weren't able to see those before, if you didn't catch the Kickstarter the first time around, this is your opportunity to watch them. Wow. And not only that, it's your opportunity to watch them with fans from all over the world and chat in real time. Right. So it's a really, really fun platform. Um, we will put some more informative news out about what Twitch is, uh, how to use it. But if you go to twitch.tv and sign up, that's the first thing you should do. Mm -hmm. Then go to twitch.tv slash TV mm -hmm. and follow our channel because we will be hosting... Uh, the event that day so you can watch it direct from our page any time of the day uh, it starts from 3pm uh, BST that's British summertime right. uh, on the 30th of September so 34 hours of Thunderbirds Crikey. to celebrate Thunderbirds Day you cannot ask for better than that I would say that and it's available anywhere in the world yeah brilliant so if you can't wait until the 30th of September well it's not long for excitement. Well, I know it's not that long, but if you can't, if you can only wait a few days for some excitement, yeah. then stay tuned for another firestorm announcement on the 27th of September. Oh. Mm. And uh, that will be of interest to international listeners and, and some others, maybe, okay. if you are unable to get to London Great. for our uh, official premiere. Um, that's all I can say for now. Right. I've already given away too much. <laughs> um, I should stop giving anything away. Oh, you, keep, you keep doing this to us. Well, I think you it's secretly important. enjoy it, it don't you? It's very important. I do a bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> and if you didn't already know, we are doing a premiere of Firestorm's mini pilot uh, on the 27th of October at MCM London at the Excel mm -hmm. from one o'clock. If you can just get yourself there, buy yourself a bracelet, a ticket, whatever it is, to get in mm -hmm. uh, to, to MCM Comic Con for the day. The screening is free, first come, first served, um, but obviously seating is limited, so if you can come along, do. Fantastic panel there. Nick Briggs, me, Gethin Anthony, um, Mike Tucker... Steve Begg and others Gosh, to be announced. Wow. So sit tight. I hope to see uh, you there. Anyway, yeah. there you go, Richard. I'm sorry to anyone who was at the Space Centre this weekend and I missed you. Mm. Unfortunately, I had to cancel due to uh, work commitments, but very good work things, which I'll be able to talk to you about in due course. Um, but it's very important that I'm available for those this coming weekend. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm just sorry I can't be in two places at once, but I hope you had a fantastic time. Uh -huh. Make sure you send us your photos. Um, maybe we'll, you, we'll put them on Fab Live yes. on the 1st of October. That would be lovely. Um, the website has been upgraded. You will experience much faster service on jerryanderson.co.uk. We've had all sorts of problems this year, but thank you for bearing with us. Um, very pleased that things are now up and running properly, so you should see more content coming. There's loads of new stuff coming from Chris Dale, new articles, new all sorts. Mm -hmm. So get over there. Um, and in the meantime, just make sure you're following Firestorm on social media, Firestorm HQ on Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, and YouTube, mm -hmm. and SF9 Firestorm on Twitter. Fantastic. And that is the end of the news. Well, well done, you. And your cat's come to congratulate me. <laughs> yes, you did so well. You deserve a meow from my cat. Oh, well done, Jamie. That's great. So lots of fantastic news there. I mean, you know, I, I know I say it every week, but there is brand new Jerry Anderson stuff happening right now. It's incredible. Mm. Very good news. Yes. Very nice. And in fact, you've said it twice today. Have I? But we'll only hear it once. <laughs> uh, um, that's the last time I mention it. Um, <laughs> Richard, we're very, very short of time. Yes, yeah, so you keep saying. 
because we've got this really lengthy Shane Rimmer interview yeah. and we've got to fit it in because if the podcast goes over two hours, then people are going to yeah. just won't have enough time to listen. No, so we've got, to, that's true. we've got to rattle through. So there's only two listener emails this week. Shall we do that? OK, let's do that. Radio. So let's okay. start off uh, with an audio clip. Now, this one has come all the way from China and it's from Paul Hyder. So uh, hello, Paul. Hi, guys, and greetings from China, where I live and work. My name's Paul Hyder. And uh, in China, the websites such as Facebook and YouTube are blocked. So I really rely on things like your podcast to keep me up to date with uh, the Jerry Anderson universe and exciting developments like Firestorm. So thank you for it and please keep it going. I was born in the 60s, so Jerry Anderson shows have always been a part of my life and uh, I've loved every one of them, particularly Captain Scarlet. I once bought uh, an annual from Captain Scarlet and the cutaways of the vehicles and the, the background information about each of the Spectrum personnel and the comic strips and so on, it really ignited a passion for Captain Scarlet and that remains my favourite show of them all. Uh, my son is five years old now. He's uh, also uh, into Captain Scarlet, although he, he likes the CGI one, the new one uh, particularly. But he still plays with the toys that I used to buy in those days. My parents weren't wealthy enough to be able to buy stuff directly from the stores, but I used to frequent jumble sales and buy things secondhand. There was a time in my teenage years where I could almost guarantee that there would be something Anderson related at every jumble sale I went to. Very exciting times. So um, we both of us uh, appreciate the podcast that you're doing and we look forward to many, many more to come. Thank you and uh, goodbye from China. That was nice, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you so I'm so much. glad to see another person handing their Jerry Anson love down to the next generation. Yes. And rightly so. It's rather nice. Uh, and nice that they found their own thing. Yeah, well, nice that he was, uh, son. you know, Paul is a fan of, uh, of your classic Captain Scarlet and his son is looking at the new Captain Scarlet. It's nice and uh, circular, isn't it? It's quite, uh, quite pleasing. It is, and I'm sure that he will migrate to the older stuff yes. as he grows up as well. Yes, of course, of course. Um, and hopefully he'll watch Firestorm in due course. Too. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? That, that would be great, mm, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, I have a quick one from um, Anthony from Down Under, oh. who we've heard from before. Yes, we have, yes. haven't we? So he says, Dear Richard and Jamie, right. I'm sure he was very careful with that. Uh, something of a relief. Previously called you Stuart, yes. I think. Thank you. Um, uh, so sad to hear the passing of Xenia Merton, who always had so much grace and presence. Her final message from Moonbase Alpha is bittersweet. Um, if you haven't seen that, look up final message from Moonbase Alpha. It's a sort of a fan-made little short, uh -huh. uh, which is the you know the final message sent out as they disappear across the universe, oh. uh, back to Earth, saying, "Please remember us." Gosh, and um, it's it's very sweet and uh, yeah, a really lovely little piece from Xenia. Mm. Uh, so. But it was very sad news to hear about her passing. Yes. Um, and only at 72, Richard. Oh, that's uh, it's criminally young, isn't it? That's terrible. It's such a shame. I mean, you know, it really does feel like losing a member of the family when, uh, you know, a Jerry Anderson alumnus leaves us. It's, uh, it's very sad indeed. Yeah, it is sad. Um, Anthony continues, though. He, he wanted to ask a question about this. Mm. Uh, is there a reason why it wasn't included on the Blu-ray or DVD release of Space 1999? Um, as it's an amazing extra and acts as a great coder. Kind regards, Anthony. Um... Anthony, as usually is the case with these things, it's either uh, a rights issue or just an availability issue, as in it was not made available for some reason at the time. Just one of those things. It is on the Japanese set, though, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, translated, if you are if you want to uh, listen to it in Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, just one of those things. Happens yeah. all the time. Not all the extras end up on every single set all over the world. Yeah. It's uh, variety the spice of life, Indeed. Eh, Richard? But it, it, I mean, it is, it is out there, isn't it, to, to see on, on YouTube and so on. So, you can uh, just watch it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Great. Anyway, I think that's probably about it all we've got time for, isn't well, it, Richard? Well, I have some breaking news, Jamie. No way. You'll be very interested Is it animal-related? It's not animal related. Oh. It's biscuit related. Oh, it's inflatable well. biscuit related. Ah, I remember. Now, yes, so, yes. Yes, you may remember Nigel Smith uh, dropping us a line last time to tell us of his inflatable Thunderbird 1, uh, <laughs> but uh, pipped at the post in a competition by his sister's inflatable digestive chocolate biscuit. Oh, yeah. And he Amazing. sent us photographic proof of a uh, aforementioned inflatable let me have biscuit. A look. Let me have a look. look at that. It's a beauty. Oh, the shine on it. Isn't that lovely? It's got that real uh, chocolatey sheen, hasn't it? I know, it's very clever, isn't Great. it? It does look quite tasty. Um, so that's fantastic. I think oh, what we could beauty. do is uh, show that photograph, with, with Nigel's permission, of course, on uh, Fab Live, which is our almost monthly Facebook Live broadcast mm. that Jamie and I do. The next one is October the 1st at 7 o'clock. 
and that's on the official Jerry Anderson Facebook page. Um, you can send us all your pictures for that. Uh, we love to see pictures of your cosplay, of your fan art, your toy collection, your models, uh, pictures of you with Jerry. Uh, pictures of your children with the Jerry Anderson uh, uh, toys and so on, anything you'd like to send, do send it along to fablive at jerryanderson.co.uk and we will do our best to show it on the next broadcast on the evening of October the 1st. But obviously you won't be able to pip the inflatable biscuit, so... No, you certainly won't. You know, and I will winner, put the inflatable biscuit on the show notes as well. Definitely, uh, that's at a great jerryanderson.co.uk slash podcast slash pod15. That's it for the listeners' emails, mm-hmm. but if you do have a question or comment for us, you can send it to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. People have been um, uh, uh, messaging us and leaving comments on YouTube as well. Pierre Fontaine. Oh, yes. Jamie. Uh, Pierre the Pantone now, checker. Exactly. I Cast your mind back. You were challenged over the last <laughs> few weeks to randomly pick a Pantone number from the colour chart to tie in with various Jerry Anderson craft. Uh, last time at Thunderbird 3, and you picked Pantone 7579. Yes. Uh, well, Pierre says it is, in fact, a slightly burnt orange that I think would be a very good match for no Thunderbird way. 3. Yeah, it's not as bright <laughs> as I imagine TV3 might be, but I do consider this to be a really good match. Uh, oh. FYI, he says, I work with Pantone colours all day, so checking your guesses is pretty easy. Right. And then, uh, with a slight weariness to his voice, I think, here, Jamie, he says, I certainly understand, however, if you want to put this new feature of the podcast to rest. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he might be giving himself away a little bit there. Maybe we could rest it for a while, but I have a sense it'll be back soon. I think so. We'll give it a sort of uh, 1980s Doctor Who hiatus. A hiatus, which is the first time I ever heard that word was in relation to the Doctor Who hiatus. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, Andrew Sierra also said, love the Firestorm mini uh, pilot minisode. We'll continue to keep my fingers crossed for a full series. Xenomoth also commented on YouTube, I'm very ready for Firestorm. I mean, aren't we all? Aren't we all, really? Come on. And finally, last time we were talking about, um, you know, certain subsections of fans, some who might like the puppet series, some who might like the, uh, the live action stuff. And, um, you know, I was asking, are they mutually exclusive? Uh, Megan commented on YouTube that she's a fan of both, although if she had to choose, it would be puppets all the way. Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet and Stingray in that order for me. So there you go. Just another addition to the uh, the conversation. I mean, it's interesting, Jamie, when, when your dad produced UFO, was he always heading towards a live action series? Was that, you know, always where he wanted to be? Always from the get go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He wanted to be doing massive epic live action movies uh, from the mid 50s. So when he got tied into doing, uh, you know, strung marionettes, uh, he was very frustrated. But that out of that frustration came this incredible improvement in the puppetry. Uh, yeah. came Super Mario Nation and came all the amazing yeah. shows throughout the 60s. So, yeah. But you can see that transition he was making towards live action, you know, with the, the change in proportions from Thunderbirds to Scarlet. Um, as you get through Joe 90 and into the Secret Service, he's starting to yeah. include live actors. So it was obviously the way he was going, although it yeah. might have been a bit of a shock for the audience going, oh, a new Jerry Anderson show. Well, oh, it's yes. got people in it. That's weird. That's right. Yeah, interesting. I yeah. Wonder why, but then, of course, like, every actor who's ever... Being in a Jerry Anderson live action series has always had to cope with the whole thing of the, of the, the acting being, you know, as bad as the puppets. Oh, yeah. So, I say so every wooden. actor. <laughs> I mean, me. <laughs> <laughs> I am not passing any comments here, Richard. No, let's not. Let's not. Anyway. Yes. I'm sure everybody wants to hear from Scott Tracy, don't they? Oh, well, of course they do. I love it, uh, Jamie, when uh, I see on Twitter that you've had a, a call from uh, the lovely Shade Rimmer. How, uh, how you get all very excited about having a phone call from Scott Tracy. Well, that always makes it's me the laugh. iconic voice, isn't it? He's Scott Tracy yeah. on my phone. Um, yeah. He's Scott Tracy on my email, contacts, address book. So, <laughs> I don't know, you know, there's just some voices which are yes. inextricably linked with certain shows. Um, yeah. I suppose, it, you know, it's like if you spoke to Tom Baker, you're speaking to the doctor, yes. really, aren't you? So yeah, of course you are. If you speak to Shane Rimmer, right. you are speaking to Scott Tracy. And when he came to pick me up from uh, the station to go around yeah. for a little chat at theirs, uh, yeah. I, I felt like I was being picked up in Thunderbird 1. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't flying, it was on wheels, but no. it, was a, it was a sort of uh, silvery grey. So, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. I, I felt like I was in Thunderbirds. And where did you meet uh, meet with Shane? Uh, Shane Rimmer at Rimmer Towers. Um, ah, of course. Yeah, I had a lovely time. Um, mm-hmm. They were so welcoming. Lovely little dogs. I had a little, little cuddle with their doggies oh, over there. Very sweet. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, so I had a chat with Shane at the kitchen table. Um, it's so difficult to cover Shane's career because he's done so much stuff. So, you know, we had, yes. to, had to skip through it quite a lot. But he, he yeah. certainly gave some interesting stories. 
and when he couldn't remember something or when he'd missed a detail uh, yeah. Sheila his lovely wife was there making us a oh. delicious lunch and uh, oh. yeah and uh, she would just jump in occasionally and give some extra info so if you can hear a woman's voice in there that is Mrs yeah. Scott Tracy uh, filling in the gaps great let's hear it here we go this is Shane Rummer uh, otherwise known as Scott Tracy and the uh, Thunderbirds Corporation. Uh, and I'm with uh, Jerry Anderson's son, Jamie, which is a, a great pleasure. I haven't seen him in quite some time. Bless you, Shane. Okay. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, <clears throat> you're, you're actually quite a difficult one in a number of ways, because everybody asks you the same questions every time, uh, and you've told the stories a thousand times before. So I am going to ask you about those things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just gone to a <laughs> <laughs> I can always remind you. Yeah. Uh, but I'd al- I also want to hear some more, more general stuff about your early career. Um, yeah. And, al- and also, I want you to feel like you can be extremely honest throughout. So if I say, yeah. you know, what were your first impressions of uh, of dad? You're mm. quite welcome to say, initially I thought he was a shiny-headed pillock or something like that. You can, you know... Uh, I never use that, but it's not a bad one. <laughs> don't, just don't use that to describe me. Okay. Uh, so uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, I would recommend they watch the... Uh, the Shane Rimmer episode of Beyond Anderson on our YouTube okay. channel because that will give you a great intro. Yeah. But how how did you get into this game of acting, Shane, and and why why did you do it? Why did I do it? I've asked myself that question quite often. <laughs> uh, well, I was when I was in Toronto before coming over here, uh, I had a a vocal trio, and um, Toronto hadn't developed that much. Uh, by the, cause this was back in the 50s. So there was some cabaret, but not much, and there certainly were no theatres, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So we were... Uh, it was... We did work quite quite often, but uh, we were wanting to work a bit more. And so we decided to see what it would be like to get to a country or get to a place where they had all the facilities to do what, what we needed. I mean, I think it was a pretty good uh, vocal act, and uh, it was just trying to find the right places to work. Mm-hmm. We worked some some places in, in, in New York and, uh, and on, the, uh, on the border between uh, Detroit and, uh, and, and Canada. But it was a potpourri sort of thing. We never knew the next... Well, we were going to have enough to eat, uh, <laughs> but it was it was all right. I tell you what, what it did do it. It certainly tuned you into how things are difficult, you know, uh, how you handle them, mm. which is always a very valuable thing. You're not taken off balance if things aren't going the way you presumed they they were going to. Yeah. So anyway, we decided on uh, on England. Uh, both my parents are from over here. My, fa- my father was born in uh, North- Northern Ireland uh, on Antrim Road, which saw a few thudding bodies around. And uh, my mother was born in Lincoln. Yep. So, you know, I've got, uh, second, second hand, I got to know quite a bit about the whole thing, and then it rather intrigued me. And then reading the list of theatres that have been existing for quite some time, and television, and radio, it had all the things that we wanted to uh, have at our disposal so we could, you know, join the crowd. Yeah. Uh, so we got on, we came over by ship, by ocean liner. <laughs> How long did that take? Weeks? Uh, no, one week. What a week, it, right, okay. Uh, just counting a couple of days when I couldn't get out of bed because I was feeling so rotten. Because <laughs> like, it was quite, it was quite a, uh, a rough passage. Yeah, I bet. Anyway, we landed at Southampton. Uh, and luckily, one of the most difficult things 
in this business is to get a proper management representative. And we were very lucky. We got a fellow called Tito Burrs, who was a who had done uh, uh, he, he played the accordion, and he had also played the variety theater. It's very very hip, very with it. He mm. wasn't sort of a from uh, last century or anything like that. <laughs> and he he got us going um, because we had no idea where to start or how to start or m much else, and uh, he was quite well known, and a good, a good accordion player, uh, and he knew all the dates, which was fine, mm -hmm. and what to, what what date you would use before another one, and then he just gathered the thing together and organized it extremely well, and he was popular, so it was a good mix, and so we traveled, we start off and hardly any variety theaters now, or if there are any at all, I don't know. But you start off on the number threes, which uh, you want to get out of there as quick as you can. <laughs> right. Uh, so, but we'd never been in a theater before. Mm. Uh, and uh, a lot of it took us a bit by surprise, but, but the, the audiences were... were, were Pretty, pretty generous. Because we know we, we uh, sometimes we'd rush things, sometimes we'd forget a lyric or something, and so you know it, it was a uh, it, it, it wasn't the four lads or the. Uh, anyway. You're probably doing yourself a disservice, Shane. I'm sure well, if, if somebody uh, picked you up to manage you and yeah. you know take you around, you must have been okay. I yes, I think so. I, uh, we had good suits. Okay, so the look, the look was on point, yeah. even if the yeah, performances we built, weren't. We built that area up <laughs> as best we could. And so we started and, and loved it. And we, I can remember us standing in the wings, watching comics and speciality acts and all this sort of thing, doing their bit on stage. And gradually, you warm to it. And you yeah. see, you know, in any... any uh, <clears throat> Uh, strangeness you have about being able to do it goes. Yeah. You're one of the crowd. You're one of the one of the entertainers. And uh, I think we got pretty well. We got to the second tier, and uh, and then to the what they call the Moss Empires. Okay. Which were very big, and uh, only in in big cities, Manchester and London and. Uh, Places of that uh, capacity uh, had big theaters and good theaters. Yeah. So could you would you say you you sort of were, were hitting the big time then well, theatrically yes. speaking? Nobody said it, but I think we. Uh, <laughs> it, it it was a good it was it always was I think it all happened within a year. Hmm. Go, going from one two to three, uh, or I mean the other way around three two, two one. Two, one. <laughs> yeah. The other way you don't want to go. No, you went up the ranks, not down. <laughs> um, and then we started doing radio and television mm -hmm. and uh, records. And uh, it was okay. We, we, uh, we started off and we didn't have a, a great deal of room for maneuver. But then it got better and we got known. And we, uh, when something works, it's a lot more fun. Absolutely, you yeah. Know? And uh, so there wasn't this terrible sort of uh, misgivings about God who'd come all this way and we're not working. <clears throat> we were working yeah. quite uh, quite a lot and enjoying it. Good. Loving it. And so, uh, you know, it's a good way to see Britain. <laughs> it is touring the theatres, yeah. especially the lower rungs, I imagine. Right. Um, Somebody so else is paying the freight. So, uh, <laughs> What was this? What was the group called? The Three Juices. The Three Juices. It was named after a, a jazz club in New York. Okay. We didn't, we never played it. We hadn't we hadn't risen to that height. Okay. Were you trading on somebody else's reputation? I tried, but it <laughs> never rubbed off to everyone. So you yeah. so you were happily it interrupted was, anyone. It was a great group. They were great. They were they? really good. 
because I was a dancer with an act called the Three Martinis, <laughs> and um, I happened to bump into them in Birmingham. Shane had left them by then and gone mm. solo. And I thought they were incredibly good singing at, you know. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Ver- you. Verified by an independent third party. Yeah, the first compliment I've ever received from her. You must stay around <laughs> for a while, not <laughs> I'll chop that out and send it to you, yeah. Shane. You can replay it whenever yeah, you like. Yeah. So there it was. We, we started being established and we started to work on the compliment, uh, so what, which is a, a, a pretty hefty sign that you're, you're getting there. You're doing well. Okay. So you toured with the, the Three Juices for a while? Yes, I think, what, was it about a year, Sheila, or more? I think it was a bit more. Well, you went solo. I know that, but I mean before. So it was about a year and a half or so. Okay. That was a tough thing to do, to leave the act. Yeah. Um, why, why did you leave, Shane? Did they kick you out? <laughs> Were you too good? They threatened to several times. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to act. I wanted okay. to get into that side of side of things because I've done some in Toronto, mainly television acting, and um, and this and this sort of thing, and London especially was really putting out some great stuff. Yeah. Um, in, in, in on television on films, uh, it was just coming together after a long time or a long build up. So I just wanted to get some of the action. So I went to them and said, uh, you know, <laughs> I, what, I, what I wanted to do, really. And uh, they were great. They got, there was another fellow in Toronto, Ray Marlowe, who was a big friend. And uh, he uh, was a baritone. I wasn't a baritone. I was a tenor, for God's sake. I had to do some jingling around that. <laughs> anyway, he, he he came over and took my place, which was terrific. So the act stayed together. Great. And uh, we just had to get some uh, some uh, rehearsals going, and they were ready ready to go again. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, got another another agent because at really unless you're right at the top of the top of the hill. Uh, you need you need more than one for you get you know, yeah. a variety and for other things and and radio and theater. So I got another agent and um, all right, and they were still talking to me, so <laughs> that was okay. So it it it, uh, it it was fine because these breakups can be, you know, they they can never leave mm. you. You know, there was always a bit of rancor there. Yeah. But uh, sounds like this was okay. Yeah, and uh, you know they wished me well, and, and uh, it, it did. It happened okay. First picture I got was Doctor Strangelove. That's an interesting star, isn't it? Yeah, very, very, <laughs> very, very. I didn't have an awful lot to do. I was a co-pilot, <clears> and uh, um, how did you get that? Did you, you, oh, the agent. The agent just said, yeah. I'm, I'm putting you up for this. It was a general sort of audition. Yeah. And they uh, um, they were looking for North American types. And but at that time, uh, North Americans found it very difficult to get in because of the uh, union rules and this sort mm-hmm. of thing. As we found it difficult getting into America. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we did. And, and uh, there I was, co-pilot. What's the name of the star of uh, Sheila? Of what? Of Doctor Strange Love, Peter Mr. Sellers. Peter Sellers, yeah. So, not too much happened without Peter Sellers <laughs> doing it. He was a lovely fellow, but he was progressive, progressively getting a bit weird. <laughs> he, uh, he couldn't. He couldn't. Uh, He's a terrible good group, for one thing. Right. Yeah, you, you just had to watch your back all the time. Um, but uh, he had this immense, immense talent. He could do anything. A voice, a voice that came out of him you wouldn't, you wouldn't think had anything to do with Peter Sellers because he could, 
you could change it so incredibly. Uh, he was great to work with. Uh, but in the end, he, uh, he, anybody was getting weekend sessions back in uh, Sweden as a second analyst. Switzerland. Switzerland. So he was, uh, doing, or was it so, Switzerland, sorry. I was getting them mixed up. <laughs> so he, he had a, a session every Sunday, I think it was, and then came back and we started again. But you could see there was a decline going on. Mm. You know, because uh, I think the uh, that sort of week after week after week, you know, and the probing and trying to explain why you did this silly things you did, uh, stress started to weigh you down a bit. And uh, and then uh, they had a camera crew. They cut off the, the very front of the plane. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is on the plane, on the, on the, on the strings, yeah, on, yeah. on this bomber. And in order, in order for the uh, camera crew to get into the flight deck, uh, they had to cut off part of the flight. <laughs> Never flew again. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, so one morning, strange love, um, Peter, uh, Peter Sellers and the director had a hell of a fight. An argument, I mean, it didn't come to blows. But Sellers got so incredibly angry that he rushed to the front of the plane forgetting that it wasn't there anymore it was <laughs> cut off and fell 10 feet to the Shepperton uh, cement floor ouch yeah and that's why he in the picture Dr. Strangelove went around in a wheelchair his leg was broken <laughs> so there he was, and with, a, with a broken leg that was trying to mend itself, going to weekly sessions with the uh, with the fellow, and and uh, he was he was a mess. He was, yeah, this couldn't, and I I'm not sure how it, how it really ended, but I think they slightly reduced some of the work he was doing. Yeah, because he had a heavy part. I mean, he was number one. And, yeah, and. Uh, but he was hmm? four parts. So he had four parts in Doctor Strange. Right? Playing four parts. Yeah. Oh yes, four parts. That's right. Uh, he, he he had an amazing talent. He really did, and he loved working mm. when he wasn't giggling. <laughs> <laughs> so was that quite an initiation by fire as your first job? Yeah. Bit of a, a hell of an intro. I, had, I mean. I, Thank God I didn't have too much to do because I think I, you know, the, the tremor in my voice would have scared the whole listener away. Um, so that was it was a, it was a good start yeah. because it was a good credit. Yeah. You know, and and also you were in a very successful production, mm. which always helps. Well, you that know, it strengthened something. I'm not sure what. But. Did the, did that uh, so that kickstarted your yeah screen yeah, that's what it was, career I think and from there you see, then the the agent can parlay uh, that credit into uh, a, a reasonable of you know a reasonable try to get other work mm. with it. and uh, and so it happened it was all right I didn't work every week but I was getting uh, you know a fair share. Keeping yourself fed and watered and ah, a, yes. a roof over your head, at least. Yeah. So what what followed Strange Love then, Shane? What were your next kind of exciting acting roles that came through? Uh, okay. See, look, Shane, I go on to IMDb and it says actor, 165 roles. Really? <laughs> That's I don't what, know what it was that, with yeah. the television you did. Yeah, it? I mean, I'm sc yeah. still scrolling down now and it's um, oh. it's quite uh, quite frightening. I had time to do anything else. I know, that's amazing. Good, cool. Bit of Doctor Who? A Doctor Who, yeah. yeah. We should probably touch on the Doctor Who. <laughs> so a, multi yeah. that, a multitude of TV roles followed, including one which yeah. I'm very pleased about, Doctor Who. He was, he was lovely, w w William Hartnell. I had so much... Um, he impressed me very much. Uh, you know, he was getting on. Mm. But he held that series together. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. And he didn't like me. 
He died with America. You're, you're saying, I was very impressed. He was a great guy. He didn't like me. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? What did you do wrong? They don't go together, usually. <laughs> uh, no, but he did. And uh, he came over and he said, uh, what part of America are you from? And I said, well, north. North. Like Canada. <laughs> and that was it. Fine. He became very fast friends. <laughs> but he had this terrible thing about, about America. I don't know whether... He had an incident that uh, never left him, and he was always... Anyway, it, it was lovely working for him, because you saw how a, a genuine leading actor worked. Mm. And that was was impressive. And um, so it, it was working out quite well. I was getting some uh, properties that were pretty good and, and pretty well known. Uh, mm. So 1963, 1964, you were in 30 episodes of Compact. I don't even know what Compact is, Shane, I'll be completely honest with you. It's a newspaper uh, series. Right. And what it was mounted for was to give uh, um, Coronation. Coronation Street some, some uh, a battle. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, because they were walking away as they're still doing. It's an amazing series. Um, they tried to uh, get it going, and they had some good good people in it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> it was a BBC production, and it was all about a newspaper. And you were the nasty editor brought in. And I was an American <laughs> editor with a hard nose. <laughs> See, I, it was it was a thing that I I didn't have to fight it, but. Uh, that that was the first impression that people had of Americans. They, mm. You know, they they're uh, meanies, tough. mean mean people. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. There's no sweetness there at all. <laughs> so anyway, I, we did that, and I think it lasted almost a year. Uh, but then it the, wasn't making an, even a dent in the Coronation Street sort of popularity. Yeah. And, but that was another crowd pleaser. It was it was something that was well known. And it was on every, every twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I think. Uh, Compact was where Jerry Anderson, your father, heard my voice mm -hmm. and thought it'd be a good voice for Scott Tracy. Uh, and so that was that was the deal. We had a we had a, a meeting. Or, you know, for uh, rehearsals and this and that, in a in a what was it? Oh, it, it was a big sort of a supermarket. You went, to, you went to his house to have a. Oh, well, I first of all went to his house, the one in uh, um, where was it? Up the M forty. Um, Gerald's Cross would it have been? Yeah, yeah. Was it? Cross. Yeah. Was that White White Plains? Was that the house? Yeah. 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 Quite impressive. It probably was, yeah. Mm. I never went, sadly. Didn't you? <laughs> no, I was, I was born too late, I think. Oh. So. Yes, it was quite a swimming pool and a lot, you know. Yeah. Little Hollywood. I, I, I've, seen some, I've seen some nice photos. Yeah, of the... So you went to the house and... We went to the house and went down to the basement <laughs> where he had a studio. Anyway, I, I read some stuff, I forget what it was. And uh, two weeks later, I got a call saying... You're Scott Tracy. <laughs> now I didn't know anything about space or anything about what, how it worked. I didn't know your father. I didn't know. Yeah, I was sort of clueless. About Do you know any of the history of the shows beforehand? Any awareness that the people you were working no. with had made these kids shows? No, I didn't. Shame. It's terrible. I lived Amazing. in a bathroom. I tell you. Well, you were very busy, weren't you? That's why you didn't have well, time to watch kids' that TV. Busy. <laughs> but, uh, so See, there, there we were. Uh, there's uh, David Graham and uh, Ray Barrett, yeah. And between them, those two had an incredible array of voices. Mm. Amazing. As a matter of fact, I was looking through the uh, 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 the book on uh, on Thunderbirds this morning, and um, it was all. They never just did one part. They did three or four during the course of a, one episode. Yeah, or more. Oh. And I, I, I didn't do it. I wasn't very good at uh, funny voices, other other voices. You were the main man, though. Yeah, Jerry but, didn't want you to do other voices. No, he didn't, really. Uh, <laughs> anyway. 
where there I was, and uh, it was great. Uh, we didn't make much much money. <laughs> I think your father took it and buried it somewhere. <laughs> Uh, so were you, were you unimpressed with the fee then? Well, I mean that if you didn't if you didn't know what had come before, yeah, did it just feel like another production, and we weren't being paid very much. Yeah, oh no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> and, and then you didn't bother about that. We did later when we realised how impoverished <laughs> we were. Um, but it was good stuff, you know. Derek Meddings is probably the the best special effects man that. England has ever produced. Oh yeah, uh, and he. The lovely thing was there was a, a, a young crew of people, fellows who had just left school, mm. in the seventeen, eighteen, and they flocked in. Yeah, and he taught each one of them. Yeah, and they all became. All, they all profited from it. Yeah, very much. Yeah, and he had a lovely way with them. There was never a raised voice with them, and but he it was thorough. What he taught them was. Things that never, they never forgot. Anyway, it was a it was a great ride, mm. and and quite a, a distinctive set of voices yeah. in that cast. Your father was very good at judging talent. Mm. There were exceptions, mind you, <laughs> but uh, he knew, and he also knew what who he wanted and what he wanted from who he wanted, and uh, he was he was. Was thorough. He just knew that business. Yeah. Uh, with no, no, no holes anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I had what he fired me once. Did he? Yeah. Twice actually. Oh, twice. <laughs> I don't think it was a it twice. It was. It was. Yeah. And uh, actually, the camera crew came to him and said, "If he's going to go, we're going to go too." Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. People stood by anyway, it, it was a big mistake, and the whole thing was, I don't know what happened. Maybe he had some bad food or something. <laughs> it's quite possible. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it got it got all uh, solved, and it, it was okay. Um, so it went on and on, and, and uh, Tony Barwick, another great talent, knew how to write. They got him from um, what's the what, what's the um, place in, in, LA, in Los Angeles, California. I thought he, I thought he was out Silicon Valley, wasn't he, or something yeah, like that, doing Valley, wasn't yeah. he a software but engineer he, or something? Yeah. yeah, amazing. But he uh, he just got tired of America. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank God for that because he he introduced me to a, to his a writing career at that mm. time. I really didn't know too much about it. I certainly didn't know about writing and about writing about space. I knew it was up there somewhere. Where I didn't know you knew about looking up, but beyond that, that was it. Yeah. So a, a very talented bunch of people. Just briefly, Shane, because we we often hear from uh, Matt Zimmerman and David Graham. Yeah. But though those who aren't around still, like Peter Dinerly and yeah. Ray Barrett and David, the, can you just get? Tell me some impressions of your your co-stars who are uh, sadly no longer yeah, with Peter us. Peter Dinerly was a he was a throwback. <laughs> he was a in uh, a nice way. I but, hope. But that, that, that's my that's complimentary. He yeah. Was, he uh, was an old time actor mm. with a great voice. Was it? it? Yeah. It scared you to say hello. Do you want to run out of the room? <laughs> he um, and he had this. MG sports car. Yeah. And you could tell five miles away, if you, you, knew, you knew he was coming to the earth, or you'd. <laughs> he was terrific. He was ex- absolutely ideal for that part of the, of the father. Oh, yeah. He had that um, uh, gravity, gravitas, whatever it was, and yet was kind with it. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a. A knockout fella, great talent. Yeah, and uh, was he was he paternal towards the rest of you? Oh, I think he was slightly distant. Okay, but not. I mean, he he, he wasn't a buddy, mm. but he uh, there was never any any strangeness in our sort of relationship. Yeah, and uh, he knew the business. He knew he'd been around. A real old pro. Yeah. I get I get that impression. Ray Barrett was a. 
a character. Uh, and I say he was doing this North Sea Oil series, I forget what it's called now. Um, and he came over and did uh, Thunderbirds. I mean, Ray, Ray played tens of characters. Oh, he did. He and David, honestly, I mean, they didn't need, didn't need much else. <laughs> They just, this is the facility they had with changing voices. Uh, the whole, whole character just was uh, replaced. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, David Holliday? David Holliday was a lovely fellow. We didn't get to know him terribly well. He was a great friend of Matt's mm. uh, because he was sort of a musical, stage musical sort of. Uh, actor, yeah, uh, and and they knew each other's work very well. Uh, he, he was he, he was great, but he didn't he wasn't he was in the series I think less than a year. Well, he, he was replaced by Jeremy Wilkin, wasn't he? Because yeah, he he left. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a, there's well there's one name who I I never hear mentioned in interviews. Um, Christine Finn. Christine Finn. Who was who played Tintin and Grandma and That's right. others. I never hear of her. She had a lovely that. voice, a lovely sort of fey voice, mm. which was ideal for a Thunderbird. Uh, and she, I think she participated in every session. Strange thing about her was that she didn't want to um, claim anything from... Thunderbirds. I don't mean that we all did, mm. but um, she she turned down um, payments and this and that. I don't know what it was all about, and nobody else did either. Mm. Uh, she she just sort of step away and leave it behind once it was done. Draw a line under it, and yes, that's exactly what it was. Huh. Interesting. Because, uh, but she was a sweetheart. I, 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 uh, whatever happened that changed her. Uh, outlook on on Thunderbirds. Uh, I don't know. Something. She never made any caustic comments about Jerry or the mm. management or anything else. Um, maybe she was involved in something else. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But she was good. They're all good. I mean, you're, you're, good. You're, you're not going to say anyone's bad, are you? Anyway, but no. it was a it was a good group, a good group. And yeah. Shane, there's there's something I. It's especially interesting for me because you you didn't know the series beforehand. Other puppet shows at the time, all of the voice work was very kind of cartoonish and young and childish. Oh, it was. Thunderbirds, very serious. And Scott Tracy, in in particular, you brought a a seriously high level of intensity to that character. Is, Is that... Was that... Were you told to do it that way? Was it a direction? Did you think? No, it was quite natural. I, I love the part. I, I, the, Tony Barwick's writing him, but the, your father and, and Sylvia uh, usually wrote the pilot. Mm. I think they wrote, they wrote the pilot for uh, uh, for the first uh, session of uh, Thunderbirds. Um, I just really thought it worked, and seeing how everything else was working in the series. It was all on, uh, in the charge of people who knew what they were doing. Mm. God, I mean, there were 18-year-olds who were, who were <laughs> really incredible. And uh, it was lovely to be in that company. You knew that things were going to be right, that's all. I mean, the best way to do it, they did it. So uh, it, it, it was a lovely feeling to have that uh, success at that at that time. Mm. I mean, it was successful right from the beginning, and then spread all around the world. I yeah. mean, it was it was an amazing uh, feat, uh, and you know I can still remember that uh, supermarket n- next door to the uh, studio. I forget where it was. That's where we re- we rehearsed. Yeah. And they had a Mars bar factory too. God, I never, I, I've never had a Mars bar since. The smell, the so, smell's nice for the first five minutes, but yeah. after that, it becomes horrible, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so, how how quickly did you become aware once Thunderbirds was on the screen that it was becoming a phenomenon and it was, you know, yeah. blowing everything else out of the water, kids it took, wise? It took a while. Okay. 
uh, for a while, we, we, you know, we did, we, it was difficult finding our bearings for a start. It was all pretty, pretty new. Then little by little, we were hearing about people's responses and reactions to the thing. And there was a lot of mail, a lot of uh, congratulatory mail about it. Mm. And uh, and then when uh, Thunderbirds and all the, uh, most of the people in it went out on the conventions and this sort of thing, that troubled the thing. We did very well. Mm. Um, there's nothing that succeeds like success. <laughs> and uh, it was a it was a good it was a good bunch to be to be with because there was so much talent mm. and such generosity with just about everybody. Yeah, and it became the start of a long and mostly happy association with oh, with all things Anderson. Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> and uh, through Tony, and also with with Jerry and Sylvia's permission. I was allowed to write uh, and got into three, I think, episodes of uh, Captain Scarlet. Yep. And then I did some for Joe Knighty. Yep. So that opened up a whole new thing. And you did the protectors or the swing. And the the protectors. Yeah. And that's when Jerry finally got, he, he was dying to do live action. <laughs> yes. He really, really wanted. Oh, I know. Well, yeah. You were UF, UFO then the protectors, wasn't it? But yeah, yeah. UFO was the first. So the, um, having been in Thunderbirds and seen it from a, you know, <laughs> character perspective, did that make the entry into writing for Captain Scarlet easier? Because you said you weren't, oh, you weren't, you weren't prepared to write kind of for space kind of no. sci-fi stuff. But re going through thirty-two episodes of Thunderbirds must have given you some yeah. sort of education. Tony Barwick really showed the way mm. for me. We were great friends, golfing friends, and everything else. <laughs> and uh, he's a lovely man. Not uh, just golfing friends or nineteenth hole friends as well. Both. <laughs> You don't do one without the other. Well, I suspected not, but <laughs> I just thought I'd no, check. No, we in a place of full of beautiful golf courses around it. Anyway, um, it was really Tony, but it, it also had to have uh, uh, Jerry's backing. Mm. I mean, he looked after everybody's position in the uh, in the company. You did have a few arguments with him over writing. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, they weren't really arguments because he won them all. Anyway. <laughs> they were one-sided. <laughs> what what kind of what kind of things were were debated? Uh, <laughs> a character. Okay. She, you know, we just tended to watch him. Um, <laughs> uh, just for certain particular characters and how they would speak. Yeah. Because it was Americanized. Yeah. To a large degree. We were all pretty well, even if they're, um, they weren't American, some of the characters, they had an American slant to it. That mid-Atlanticness yeah. to them, yeah. And Tony wrote in a kind of an Americanese. Mm. Uh, they, uh, so it, it was uh, purely just to get for the market. Yep. You know, and... Um, the lovely thing is, once something takes off like that and gets some traction, uh, other people want it. Mm. I mean, they have people looking all the time at poss possible uh, um, series and, and, and properties that are winners. Mm. And this certainly was that. Yeah, you had a long, a yeah. long sequence of them. Yeah. So um, you, you carried on doing voice work as well as writing on Scarlet yeah. and Joe 90. Yeah. Then you had a little break from all things Anderson, uh, late sixties. UFO, yeah. You made some appearances in, yes. As a pilot again, more co-piloting. I had no idea of, from one end of the apparatus in front of me what it did. <laughs> it's crazy. It looked very convincing though, Shane. Yeah. Oh, that's good. The, the marvel of an actor. Us. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that probably covered Shane's panicked eyes oh, yeah. going, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, so we did some live action bits and pieces. Uh, then The Persuaders, Diamonds Are Forever, Baffled, yeah. Scorpio. I mean, there's, 
the pro- again, the problem with you, Shane, is you've done so much, it makes it very difficult to squeeze things into a short period of time. Yeah, I think it's just that um, for major films and this sort of thing, they don't have time to uh, try to teach somebody something. They, they, they want somebody who has a bit of background and yep. has a, a, a bit of credit and hopefully that, that, that'll feed something into the production they're hiring them. For. Yeah. So you made their lives easier by being a pro, obviously. Oh. Can, I want to touch briefly on the pilot episode, The Investigator. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's... I mean, we it, did that, did we? Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid so. I, we, it can't be skipped over. Um, I think you... So you played John in it, the, the young yeah. boy character, and I, you also wrote the screenplay, I think. Is that... Is that yeah, I wrote right? one. I, I, well, there I, only was one, Shane. So. Yes. Well, that's the one I wrote. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a peculiar little idea. It is. Um, did you feel it was a peculiar little idea at the time? Well, I didn't say anything because I went out there with your with your dad out to this church in Malta, in a valley somewhere, uh, <laughs> quite near the studio. Yes, it it. Um, I didn't know whether. Jerry was taking another pathway to some, something else. Yeah, he was opening up another whole new uh, future. Anyway, uh, yeah, it didn't really... It didn't land, did it? No. I mean, I, I get the feeling like it was a, a little... A, a, an excuse to have a holiday to Malta. Diversion. Oh, yeah, Tony was out there, yeah. That's right. Uh, I think maybe you have something there. Yeah. Okay, well, we won't talk too much about but, that then. <laughs> you know, when you consider the amount of things that happened through that studio, it's amazing that there was only one that was slightly questionable. <laughs> and everybody, what the hell is this? That is, that's very charitable of you to yeah. describe it that way. Um, so you, you popped up in The Protectors. Yeah. Two episodes there, another that bit of a dad. Yeah. Why, why was that interesting? The characters in it. Okay. I mean, the protectors. Was that the one with Robert Vaughn? Robert Vaughn, Nari Dawn Porter. Yeah. Yeah. Good scripts again. There was Tony. Yeah. I, God, I don't know what he... He was amazing. He yeah. was you did and, what? You did the Zeke's Blues. Huh? You did Zeke's Blues. Zeke's Blues. Yeah, I wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tony uh, Curtis, who was doing a series uh, with Roger Moore, I uh, was supposed to to do that part. It was yeah. a jazz pianist who was a friend of uh, of Rogers, uh, and then he got called back to Hollywood. Right. There was some sort of um, agreement that if needed, he would have to do that. So he left, and I walked into the studio. I you know the next morning, everybody was looking like that. You know, they they lost their whatever it was that. Most prize. Anyway, I said uh, they told me that, uh, that Tony had gone and he'd gone back. And uh, you got a call from Jerry. You had to go and see him. Who are we going to get to replace him? And Jerry said, "Well, uh, we figured that out all right." <laughs> he said, "You wrote it. You acted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you did this. You can deal with it." Yeah. So I did. I actually. The things that happened during that series were all um, long-term. I mean, they, they, they fed the long-term sort mm. of situation. And that, that was good, having to do that, because I, God, I, I, I know I had terrible qualms about it when I first began. But it, um, it was great that you, you know, when, when a necessity comes up, you do it. Yeah. You don't mess yeah, well, about, you can't. When you're an actor, you say yes to whatever comes your way, right? You do indeed. Yeah. Uh, you popped up in Space 1999 as yes. well, continuing your association. Yes. By this, by that time, you must have got used to the kind of, the, generally speaking, the success of the Anderson machine. Yeah. Did, did, did Space 1999 look and feel big budget? Oh, it did. I mean, the, the, the two leads, Martin. Hmm. Uh, Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. Yeah, yeah, and they, and they were good. They worked well together, and uh, and and they drew good audiences. So it, you know, it, it uh, 
And Tony's writing sort of fitted into the situation very well, as it usually did. Mm -hmm. um, and they had other guest writers too because it was a long term thing. Yeah. But they were good. Um, uh, so Jerry was very happy at that point that things were going well in this live action world. Yeah. He'd kind of hit what he wanted to be doing. Oh, yes, indeed. And he was good at it. Yeah. That was the thing. I mean, you, you could make a stuff like that, not having too much experience in that particular phase of things. And they're disasters. <laughs> they could be disasters. And yet he, uh, he got, he got the, the, the necessities down there and they had the right people doing the right thing. Yeah. Uh, so, Shane, you then, then had a, a, basically a 10-year gap of doing anything Anderson. Did I? Yeah. You went through all sorts of other stuff. You did yeah. your little bit in Star Wars, um, uh, Return of the Saint... Where else do we go through here? Superman 2. Yes. Uh, some great cult bits and pieces. And 3. And 3, yes, absolutely. Uh, Gandhi. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, I could go on. I can't read them all out because it would take several hours. But we, you get you, you, you ended up in the mid-80s doing two, two projects, two extremely different projects with Dad. Space Police, the pilot. Yeah. And Dick Spanner, which I don't think could be further apart in no. in their style. Uh, so let's let's deal with the more sci-fi, the more obvious one first. Space Police. Yeah. Um, you you played Brogan. Yeah. Uh, and you were surrounded by uh, kind of uh, human-sized cat aliens. Yes. I mean, it was a it was a real blend of all the stuff. That Dad had worked on yeah. stop motion, puppetry, animatronics, live yeah. action. With all those cat thing people, I thought it was in the wrong room. I'm not surprised. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was another Tony Barwick piece. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know what my feelings were about that. I mean, it was lovely to be a sort of a, in that position. Yeah. And the girl was good too. The, the, Catherine Chevalier. Oh, yes, indeed. I just looked at Sheila and it, I absorbed the, oh, the yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Uh, I I think what might have gone wrong, and I, I shouldn't criticise whether... Absolutely, you should, Shane. What do you think went wrong? Animal... Uh, I don't think that worked very well. No, they were, they were a bit kind of... Uh, sort of somewhere uh, between cute and scary. Uh, it, they were, and you didn't believe them. No. When they opened their mouths and said something, you said, you know, what is this happening here? <laughs> and they, uh, but that was one error out of 20, I think. Well, um, yeah, and, and not as much of a, a an odd choice as the investigator. I no. think Space Police holds up better than the investigator. Yeah, I think it did. I think it had... It had promise. I just yeah. think there was a bit of miscasting there. Yeah, yeah, and um, it did, and it did eventually get there much later on, to yeah. many, many years. Um, Dick Spanner, on the other hand, I love Dick Spanner. I love Dick Spanner as well. But how on earth were you approached with this? I mean, bearing in mind that you'd done the puppet voices for these very serious, big budget. Uh, series in the 60s then you'd been in these big budget live action things you've been doing yeah. big budget movies and then they come along and say we're making this stop motion thing on a shoestring and we yeah. want you to play a robot detective who is really crap at his job mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's going to go out on channel four in the middle of a magazine show with Janet Street Porter how do you feel yeah. about that Shane I mean <laughs> uh, just... I took one look at the script and said, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the problem, the difficulty with that was not laughing. Because <laughs> Tony was, he was in an absurd frame of mind when he wrote that thing. So Clearly. Some of the uh, innuendos and some of the stuff that happened, you couldn't believe it. Yeah. And you really had to force yourself not to laugh. Yeah. Because Jerry thought, was there too. When you first did that, Jerry and Tony and you were the only three there. Yeah. And apparently you said that Jerry couldn't stop laughing either. So no. you had 
difficult. It almost fell off his studio chair. <laughs> but it was, uh, yes, it was. I, sorry I didn't catch on. I, well, I mean, you must be too. Yeah. Because I thought it was a good property and I thought it was different. And it, oh, wow, yeah. And, and it worked. I mean, it was different to anything else, Anderson, yeah. before or since. Uh, it was very much its own little I've got a fun thing. that this lady moved into BBC casting sort of area just before that happened. And she reviewed all, everything that was going out, she reviewed and took a meat chopper to a lot of it. Mm. I don't... I, I just think, felt it wasn't given its due reward. No, no, it no. should have should have carried on. Really, it was a great yeah. little, yeah. great fun series. So, if anybody hasn't seen that, they should, uh, they should check it out. Um, after that, Shane, we get to nineteen ninety one, when Thunderbirds was replayed by the BBC, and suddenly got a whole new audience. Now, I was at school at this point, six, turning seven years old. <laughs> So all of my friends... Don't stop it. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. But all of my friends were watching it. Yeah. All of their parents were watching it again and bringing in Thunderbirds annuals from the 60s to give to me to take home to get signed by Dad and return my to God. them. Really? It was utterly bizarre. Mm. All of my friends thought that it had been made recently because it had such a timeless quality visually. But did, I mean, did you ever think this thing would come back and bite you? Well, not bite you, but... <laughs> I don't know, re reward you all over again. It must have been strange to watch that happening. Yeah. Well, I think you, you, do, you do get used to reversals in a, in a way because nothing is guaranteed in this business. You know, it just isn't. Uh, it, 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 there's a vulnerability there that uh, either things happen or they don't happen. And you can't really get too upset by it because it, it, um, it's a, you know, the roll of the dice. Uh, but some, some properties you really hope go just because of the flavor. Yeah. Lovely flavor to them. And the writing, I think mean, Tony was absolutely sky high with that thing. Loved it. I, thought, I never saw him or read him that sort of writing from Tony before. Mm. He was a good writer, very good writer, but he had an almost slightly slapstick sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. he was a great, a great guy. But did, and, did but did, this, did did the new the renewed success of Thunderbirds back in the nineties surprise you? No, but we were thrilled. I bet you were thrilled. I thought it yeah. was just wonderful that it came back. You know? yeah. yeah, and you could see it on television. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a lovely thing. I mean, it, just as much as uh, reversals uh, don't hopefully uh, uh, present too much of a problem, uh, you get to feel like a part of a winning team mm. in uh, things like Thunderbirds, simply because uh, you were there when it happened. Was, yeah. And you know that uh, it deserves that kind of accolade yeah so you know you, you become uh, and, and you're just happy that you're fortunate enough to be part of it yeah so. well you're you're part of something which is one of the best loved children's tv shows oh, in british yes. history it's more than children's tv shows of course i mean it is just incredible how still men you know 55 to 60 come and bring their boys yeah. and girls and they've all got the books and the whatever, and they just and the women particularly just stand there with tears in their eyes, yeah. saying, "You know, you're because it's the voice for change." Absolutely, yeah. It's always the voice. Everything he's ever done, they recognise him because Scott Tracy's voice was in that program. Mm, yeah, quite extraordinary. It's one of the most the, one of well, he, probably the most memorable voice, I guess. Yeah, but it's it's an older voice now. It, it doesn't stop people from. No, of course. Recognizing. No, he still's got. I, I, I sent a text to somebody when I was waiting at the station, saying, "Just waiting for Scott Tracy to pick me up," because you know people do still have that yeah. feeling. So you're even now, fifty three years later, 
you're going to conventions, yeah. people are still coming up and hero worshipping you, they're handing the show down to their kids, uh, and they're getting yeah, excited. Well, that's, uh, con- continuing. Um, I like doing conventions because there, there, there's a nice spirit there. Mm. You know, nobody's banging anybody on the head or trying to cut in, in front of anybody. Everybody's quite easy with the situation. Yeah. We need to get there. So I've been very fortunate, I think. Very fortunate. Yeah. Well, people can love still meeting you. Shane, to, to round off, I have some questions that fans have sent in for you. Relatively quick fire ones. Someone just says, can you please thank Shane for everything, especially for Scott Tracy? There you go. That's quite a nice uh, <laughs> a nice thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, further down. Yeah, that's from, yeah, Chris Ferguson says, just say a very big thank you to Shane, please. So there you go, Chris. Uh, Rob says, we're asking specifically any bloopers or funny things that happened during the recording of Thunderbirds. I mean, I'm sure, I get the feeling that somebody like Matt Zimmerman would have been messing around quite a lot. Or did you all take it very seriously in the recordings? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, you messed around, did you? Well, you don't do it uh, with the thought that somebody might get uh, upset by it. <laughs> you, you develop a technique. Yeah. You see, you can mess around a little bit. But, um, I mean, when something funny is written or somebody makes a funny noise, yeah. uh, you know, you're allowed to laugh at that. It's not Springberg or something like that. No. It's all story. I think, a, I think a, a happy recording booth that laughs from time to time makes yeah. for a better show. Yeah, um, James Pilson Wood asks, what is your fondest memory of working with uh, Jerry Anderson? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> when he hired me back after far, firing me, uh, <laughs> to kiss them. Okay, that's when. What? So when was that firing and rehiring? Oh, it, it was still. It must have been still during, probably the latter half of Thunderbirds. Okay, that was when you had to go and get a job, and you got a bike, and you biked all the way along the North Circle. Oh God! Yeah, metal worked in a factory. Yeah. As <laughs> I, I, I was biking home, Sylvia phoned up and said, Jerry and I would like you to write a script for Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Threw the bloody bike on a ditch and went, <laughs> Yo. Fantastic. Uh, um, uh, Fran has asked, which Anderson character are you, are you most proud of? I think I can guess which one. Which character you played for dad you're most proud of surely scott tracy well scott must be uh you know, with a nice nicely written part um mark says where did you get the inspiration when you wrote your captain scarlet episodes how did you come up with those ideas because so- sometimes a script editor will say here's a basic plot off you go, yeah. go and write about that. Mm. What was the what about for the Scarlet stories? Did you come up with them off your own bat? Or? I think uh, uh, Tony would al- always like to get together with a writer before the actual uh, writing took place, um, and I think I probably did, did, did it out on the golf course. You know, you did one though. Was about Canada, wasn't that Breakaway or? Where there was all snow and everything, and you took it. Might be Avalanche. Oh yeah, yeah. Is that Avalanche? Might have been Avalanche. Yeah, yeah. And so, what's what's the inspiration for that? Where's I don't. Well, it gets in every. (laughs) (laughs) There's snow in Canada. That's the inspiration. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, it gets into the into the into the bloodstream or something. I don't know because the more you write, the easier these things get. I mean, and, and other things occur to you that will help yes. uh, get the thing moving, yeah. keep it moving. So it's a, uh, I, I never knew, never never occurred to me, except Tony, God knows how many uh, scripts he wrote. Hundreds, I think. All different. 
and uh, you know with, with different textures to them, different situations, and so. But he could do it so, and he would wait so about twenty four hours before the before the uh, he had to re put it in. Yeah. He, I, you know, I almost had heart attacks. Like, <laughs> him. He was very casual about it. I've, I've got a great little clip of him describing his process of writing a Scarlet story, and he, he, he just said, "Well, you know, I just sort of think the Mistrons would say something nasty, you know, lay out their threat, and uh, that's it, done." That sounds like it. He was very relaxed about it. Amazing. Oh, he was. Shane, before I, I let you go. Uh, Across all that time working with Dad, you're one of one of the longest standing uh, voice and voice artists and actors who worked with Dad across all those years. Um, I don't. Want you to, I, I'm not going to make you say anything sappy. Don't worry. But if you is there anything that you can identify in the spirit of all Jerry Anderson productions that makes them all seem part of the mm -hmm. same heritage, the same universe? They all have something special about them. Any ideas? I don't think any character is in the slightest case fraudulent. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, Jerry really held the writers to produce speeches and conversations that rang true. And uh, it was, it's always a joy to work with that sort of situation where you're not having to put some sense of belief into what you're doing. It's there yeah. in the writing. So uh, that, 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 that really was, I think, a standout thing. Aside from Jerry having the best people he could possibly get in chief jobs, it was that that he, he kept a, a very close eye on all writings and all, all situations that were mm. going to be fellow cast. And, and, and wouldn't settle for anything less than what he knew to be the way to do it. So the best so, the best crews and the best characters. Yeah, that's it. That's Not a bad way to go through, is it? No, that's a great summary. Yeah. Uh, if people want to meet you or find you, website or convention calendar, what's the what's the best way for people well, to find out what you're, what you're doing? On Shane's website, they, it, we put... Well, Damien puts all the conventions and stuff that he's doing. And what is Shane's website, Sheena? www.shanerimmer.com There you go, shanerimmer.com, that's where to go. Um, and you're, I'm sure you're always happy to meet yeah. Scott oh, Tracy yeah, fans. I'm, I'm quite happy for you to do that. Anyway, good, thanks for the... Uh... Thanks, Shane. Brilliant. Lovely stuff. Well, Aww. I did my Amazing. very best to span Shane's entire career, but I obviously had to take in the Anderson shows, but he's had so many yeah. roles across so yeah. many films and TV productions over the yes. decades. It's Prolific. Just, yeah. just absolutely amazing. So, um, and uh, I mean, I mean, talking of roles, then what, what did you, uh, what did you have for lunch? Does that anything nice? Is that you've, you've well, heard just, this amazing interview, or you want to ask about is the bloody food? Well, I'm just curious what you might be fed by, you know, by Shane Rimmer. What the Tracy's here at home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did you... They, um, it was very nice. We had um, nice sourdough loaf. Yeah, was... you didn't have a Thunderbird bun then. <laughs> uh, is that tumbleweed going past there? Well, um, just uh, a thought. Some nice cheese. Um, yes. And. Uh, uh, a nice avocado and tomato and uh, red onion salad, which is delicious. Oh, some leaves, gosh. some nice ham. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, appropriately enough, perhaps. Oh, <laughs> all rude, maybe. Don't tell him I said that. Uh, I, I won't. Uh, he almost <laughs> certainly won't listen to this, I'm sure. Uh, um, uh, yeah, in fact, even talking about it, I'm getting quite hungry. So it was. Yeah, well, me too. Nice. And I've had a whole bag of uh, licorice all sorts to myself you have. as well. I know. Oink. Oh. Uh, very nice. Uh, lovely. Always lovely to speak to Shane. I bumped into him a few times back in the day when we were doing conventions, and uh, he was always delightful. Yes. Really lovely to spend some time with. He is a very nice, nice man. Yeah, very good. So if you want to listen to all our other uh, interviews that uh, we've had over the past uh, few podcasts, well, you can catch up with them all on whichever platform you're listening to us on. There is uh, all the likes of Lee Sullivan and Chris Packham and Sophie Aldred and Sophia Miles and Gary Newman. Uh, Lisa Mazimbo uh, also we've had um, uh, a message on Twitter I think from uh, Yuhan Solo who says I don't know how but you need to find a way to interview Robert Meyer Burnett his knowledge of geek culture is um, immense 
Uh, this one followed a tweet from Robert in which he said that the moon landing deniers are only half correct. We lost the real moon in 1999 with the actual Apollo landing sites. Since then, we've only ever seen the fake moon put up by government contractors and NASA scientists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you never know. But yeah, we love your ideas on who to uh, interview. Of course, it's just a matter of when they're available and if they if they want to, I suppose. Exactly. Well, I, I know Rob, uh, and he's already said he'd like to, as long as he can talk about UFO. Um, Fair and enough. In the coming weeks, we've got interviews with Mike Tucker, Mr. Model Effects uh, from mm -hmm. Red Dwarf and Doctor Who and now Firestorm. Um, uh -huh. And also a great chat with Phil Plate, who is an ast astronomer, science communicator, all sorts of stuff, bad astronomer on Twitter. Um, yeah. A very nice chap who loves Space 1999. And we had a great chat all about everything Space 1999 and a little bit beyond, um, great. including the science of uh, kicking the moon out of Earth's orbit, or more yeah. importantly, the sun's <laughs> gravitational pull, ah, okay. uh, which is quite interesting. Nice. But uh, yeah, really interesting chat for Space 1999 fans. That'll be out in a couple of weeks' time as well. Yeah. So lots Phil of Phil Plate sounds, sounds like a dentist, doesn't he? <laughs> Does he? Does he, Richard? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm just, you know, or, just trying to brighten everyone's life. Yeah, or uh, someone who runs a um, a buffet restaurant. Yes, uh, yes, even better. There you go. I'm sure Phil Talking which, did you have any, uh, did you have a dessert? Wh when? Well, the Rimmers. Are you still any going about the food or? there? No, I'm, just, I'm just asking. <sighs> um, uh, so uh, Sheila, after we'd eaten, just been into the kitchen and went, ooh, gosh, they look lovely, don't they? And I right. didn't know what she was talking about. And I went out and, um, yes, dessert. The, the dessert on offer was some lovely looking plums. Um, oh, uh, but from I, the garden? I was, no, from the supermarket. Interesting. I did oh. ask that same question, but. Uh, yes. Yeah, lovely. I'm disappointing. Lovely All right. I mean, no, no, I'm, not I'm grateful, the Richard. Uh, the plums <laughs> look great, but I, I had eaten all the sourdough and the cheese, so I was quite yeah, full. So yeah. no plums for me. But thank you, oh, Sheila, for plum, offering me your plums. They were lovely. They yes. looked lovely. I bet they did. Uh, anyway, Richard, can we move on? We've got other things oh, to do. We really have, haven't we? Mm. Slightly sidetracked there. Yeah, sidetracked by Mrs. Scott Tracy's plums. Uh, <laughs> totally off topic and too tangential. <laughs> Look, should we um, go to another place where somebody is dining out? Oh, yes. Uh, well, everyone's at it, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, well, uh, even in the randomizer yeah. this segment... Um, Chris has got a rather nice um, dinner date with a couple, oh, of, has he now? couple of people you might know. Yeah. Oh, we weren't crikey. invited. No, we weren't, were we? Thanks, Typical. Chris. Anyway. Here you go. Mm. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm not usually one for seafood, but that was delicious, wasn't it? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also not one for small talk, as you've probably noticed, but of course, uh, neither are the two of you. Uh, uh, um, so, Afeni, Marina's told you what she's helping me with at the moment, has she? Yes. Uh, Marina, one day you're going to have to teach me what this whole hand-waving thing means. Uh, uh, does that mean he's, he's happy about it? Oh, well, good, I'm glad about that. Uh, wow. Well. Oh, I know what let's do. How about we let Afeni press the button on the randomizer this week? Okay, here we go. Well, Afeni, you, uh, you certainly have a lot of books here, don't you? Hmm. Oh, thank God. Right, let's see. Well, once again, the randomizer is treating us to a series that we've not yet seen come up. Here's Space Precinct Deadline. So I I first saw Space Precinct when it was shown on BBC. Uh, I want to say autumn 1995 was when that was on. I was so excited for this show uh, because I knew, I, I loved obviously the earlier Jerry Anderson shows that had been played on the BBC, Thunderbird, Stingray, Scarlet and Joe 90. Um, and I'm not sure to what extent I was aware, but I knew that they weren't like current shows, these were old shows. But here came a brand new Jerry Anderson series for my generation. And uh, even though looking at it today, it is very uneven. Um, there's a lot that works, there's a lot that doesn't. As a kid, I just adored this show. I would watch this every week. Uh, Monday nights, I think it was on BBC Two. Um, I don't have particularly strong memories of this episode though. So it'll be interesting to see what we come up with here. Imagine relaxing 
Uh, now this episode uh, features this uh, dirigible covered in uh, advertising screens and is very off, um, very obviously a nod to similar kind of things in Blade Runner, uh, which I've actually only seen a couple of times, so I'm not hugely qualified to talk about Blade Runner, but um, it is obviously a huge influence on the design aesthetic of this show. Demeter City is very much based on uh, the, the styles of, of uh, cities you would see in Blade Runner. And you can see that influence actually going back to Space Police, the original pilot. There's a, a shot in that of Rogan's cruiser just flying across the city that is so obviously a, a nod to a specific shot from Blade Runner. This reminds me of that belly dancer on Alalap 7. You relate everything to the opposite sex, Haldane? Yeah. Doesn't everybody? And this is something that I, I don't think gets enough uh, praise in Space Precinct. The Jack Haldane character, on paper, should be absolutely, god-awfully unbearable. Rob Youngblood does a fantastic job with Haldane. I, to the extent that this character that I, I really should hate, um, is probably one of my, my favourite characters on the show. Um, because you can see he does have that, that sort of brash, know-all exterior. Um, but he, he gives it this underlying sense of, of vulnerability. You know that a lot of it, the cockiness, is just an act. And it's it's lovely when you see the real character shining through underneath. We'll take it, Jane. We copy, Brogan. We'll stay on the limo. This is a lovely opening uh, effect sequence. I do love it whenever multiple police cruisers are tearing through the city. It does look really nice, especially at night. I don't think Demeter City really looks all that good there. Uh, in uh, daytime shots, which thankfully were only limited to really the first few episodes, then I think they must have realised the city just looks so much better at night, and they they stuck with night shots for the rest of the series. Um, and here's a, a fun nod to the old sort of World War Two uh, scenario of kind of um, bouncing the bomb to uh, to knock it off course, which was uh, uh, realised uh, quite spectacularly in uh, Thunderbirds as well in Ricochet. Oh, that is a fantastic shot of the cruiser crash landing into the, the cafe. Culminating in... A very uh, cheesy one line. Table for two. Can you remember the last time we had a moment to ourselves? I mean, you know, like this. A sleeper awake. <laughs> now here we have uh, something that had to happen, I think by law, in every single Space Precinct episode. We had to have scenes of Lieutenant Brogan at home, and this is something that I hugely sympathise with Jerry Anderson over because I am absolutely convinced that these scenes were there as a direct response to people who reviewed his previous live-action shows and saying, oh, he's he's got rid of the puppets, but the actors are still wooden, and, and humorous things like that that we've all heard. And stopping the story cold every week to have these... Uh, just designated character moments. Yay, you're home. With, um, I mean, Brogan's family aren't entirely likeable. I've got to say they're not. Uh, if I had a family like Brogan's, I would probably want to be out on the street risking being shot by uh, by murderous criminals as well. But uh, it is such a shame because you can see that Jerry has put all this stuff in as a response to those criticisms. And by and large, it utterly fails to the point where these scenes were being criticised by people reviewing the show just as badly as the previous reviews were giving him. Um, you should have stuck with New Hawaii, at least you know where to find it. I, I just, I feel so sorry for him. Now here we have a, uh, another look at the, uh, the streets of Demeter City and uh, I think one of the, the failings of this show is that Demeter City, although the models look spectacular, especially at night, as I previously said, the um, street scenes, the live-action street scenes, look absolutely terrible. I mean, this shot of the, the uh, Fat Creon's car just driving right down the street is uh, quite embarrassing. Ow, don't touch me! <laughs> but it's not just that, it's the fact that Space, Space Precinct was produced in the early 1990s, and their vision of the future in terms of um, clothing and hairstyles and even discos in several episodes seemed to be the 1980s are back and they're back in a big way. Uh, it just... It, all the you know, neon dyed hair and uh, various other flash clothes. I mean, there's an old man there with bright pink dreadlocks 
What is that about? There he is again! Oh no, we have a pair of uh, sinister Creons who we later find out are in league with our main guest star for this episode. For each body part is pretty mind-boggling. The wonderful, uh, and I use the, the word in uh, all possible connotations, Stephen Burkoff who uh, had previously appeared in uh, UFO several episodes as uh, an interceptor pilot. Yes, Doctor. Um, uh, Stephen Burkoff is one of those actors who, uh, I think much like uh, Brian Blessed, um, for the first few decades of their acting career, they were just an ordinary actor with, you know, delivering good performances, but nothing really stand out. And then they become almost a parody of themselves. And I think by this point, Stephen Burkhoff was very much, uh, very much a parody of himself. Away from asteroid A16, a miner who died in a cave-in. Any scenery there, that there is around to chew, he will just latch onto it with uh, both gums and not let go. Now, uh, the design of Wirt here, this uh, alien tramp, the uh, Clyburn, is a very nice design and... Uh, I could be wrong, but I don't remember seeing any other Clyburns in any other episodes. Um, obviously, the Creons and the Tarns are the main uh, residents of Demeter City. Occasionally, you had uh, the uh, Zyronites appearing in uh, a couple of stories. But by and large, the background aliens were, I think they were called Jellyheads. They were just uh, very limited, uh, simple masks, no real elaborate animatronics. So it's a shame, if I'm right, that the Clyburns never returned, that... Uh, that they weren't thought worthy of being brought back because it's a very nice design. The three-arm thing, I think, works really well. And the faces are very expressive as well, even on the old lady that we saw earlier who was knitting. Oh, and there we go. The emergency services number in Demeter City is 911, which again points to my earlier comment that uh, transplants to the, latest the Space Precinct's idea of the future was just it's going to be more or less like it is now. Um, Paradise Street, Code 3. I, I, we never really got a sense of any, any true alien cultures in this show. It was just like Demeter City was basically New York with flying cars, which is, you know, is nice enough, but uh, it's not quite all it could have been. All I know is it was a couple of Creons. Now this kid playing, um, uh, Wirt's friend Speedy, I think it was, uh, I seem to recall seeing him in, in several adverts, um, made around this time, uh, I think toy commercials, I could be wrong, I'll have to look that up. Um, and considering the level of dubbing that was going on elsewhere in the series, uh, rather unnecessary dubbing, I think, it's interesting that this... This uh, kid actor, whose name I don't know, um, actually delivers a really good performance, and his voice is not dubbed. Uh, I'm wondering if he might just more than I can say for most humans might actually be American. I don't think a a British kid could probably pull off such a good American accent at that point. So you'll find him. But it is a really nice performance of this uh, this street urchin who just wants to get his friend back. I can't afford any damage to my reputation. Believe this is some prime Stephen Burkhoff we're getting here. He is, uh, even in parts like this, which would be very, very minor in his career, to the extent where I doubt he even remembers doing this, he is always, you always know what you're going to get with him. And you also know that it's going to be a bit weird and a bit um, slightly off-kilter with the rest of the performances that are going on around him. That's probably why he's had such a, such a long career, because... Uh, it's dependable weird that Stephen Burkhoff brings to uh, to his role. Okay, so far we've got a dead... See, that, that, there's a shot there of Demeter City in broad daylight, and it looks fairly unimpressive. Just reinforces what I said earlier, the nighttime model shots in this show are really lovely. And I'm not entirely sure what, what the problem is. So um, what? Other than that, the night adds obviously a lot of shadow. There's like, there's more atmosphere in the nighttime shots with like smoke and such drifting around. 
in broad daylight, it is just a blue sky, and the models really do look more like models, whereas in the nighttime shots, they're bordering on sort of feature film quality. It's a real, for lack of a better term, night and day difference. Stephen Burkhoff's idea of being a doctor just seems to be sit on a little round table, drumming his fingers on the desk and looking grumpy. Um, I would love to know what he's like in real life, actually. I can't imagine he's too far removed from this. Dr. Jory, Amanda Spox, Demeter City Times. Now, here we have uh, uh, Jane Castle has gone, uh, well, not undercover, but she's uh, posing as a reporter in order to get more information out of uh, Dr. Jory. Now, uh, I am aware that Simone Bendix was not happy with this uh, this uh, sexy outfit that she was forced to wear. Um, and I also remember a lot of shots from this episode of her in this costume were used in, like, pre-publicity uh, pre pre well, material. Um, I had a scrapbook as a kid. I used to save cuttings of uh, space, piece, uh, space precinct-related bits and pieces. And I remember there was an article about the launch of the show that was, like, 80% a photo of her in this costume. Now, um... Great many different species. While I certainly think that... Uh, I certainly understand her, um... That is a coincidence her issues with the character being presented this way. And I don't think, um, of the human characters, I don't think Jane Castle was um, was given the strongest introduction. I think Brogan and Haldane were, because they had each other to spark off of. Castle was more seen with, uh, with the alien characters. And I get the feeling that Simone Bendix was kind of lost in the early episodes, that she wasn't sure how to interact with these... Uh, these bizarre creatures. I think she very quickly picked it up. Um, but uh, died in an accident. She she was off to a fairly rocky start, and this episode was, I think, the eighth made. Uh, not not a good sign to get something like this so early on down the road um, to be pushed as the sex symbol rather than an equal colleague to the male characters. Um, I will say one word about the uh, the outfit she's wearing here. Gosh. A reporter was here asking about a Clyburn called Udo Wirt. Now, here we have uh, Dr. Jory uh, telling off his two Creon henchmen, Rick and Pike. Now, Pike is... Uh, he's ringing some bells with me, actually, because I'm looking at him and thinking... Uh, I, I seem to recognise the posture, the body language, the, uh, the tone of the voice... It's going to drive me nuts if I can't figure it out. You go down. See, that voice. I recognise that voice. Now that we have that settled... I'm going to have to look on the end credits and see who played Pike now, because uh, that's going to bother me otherwise. Oh, no. Here we have another street scene in Demeter City where they're watching a, uh, a robotic mime. And, yeah, as I said earlier, Demeter City is where the 80s went to die. It's uh, oh, fairly cheesy, and it's made worse by the fact that I'm pretty sure throughout the entire series, the only street-level Demeter City scenes we have are all shot on this one set, with a very clean floor. It's just one corner of an alleyway with, like, a, a warehouse door in one corner and a little video phone in another. Some more money really needed to be thrown at... Uh, at the Demeter City stuff. Oh my goodness, there is an extra there who I I can't even begin to to describe what he's wearing. He looks about 60, possibly older. It looks like, I tell you what it looks like. It looks like if uh, if a glam rocker was cosplaying as Isaac Newton in the future. That's what I'm seeing here. My folks walked off a colony ship right into the Tarn Crean riots. They never had a chance. And now that, that's an, another interesting little bit of world building there. And it's such a shame, as I said earlier, that this series never really established truly alien cultures. I mean, what are the differences between the Creons and the Tarns? Aside from the fact that the Tarns have one more eye than the Creons, I don't know what we're supposed to, what we're supposed to know about them. Um, they are basically interchangeable, which is a shame because you're creating a whole alien species, a whole alien world. You can do so many things with this, and they just kind of, like... It was too much trouble. I suppose the 
the focus was on the storylines and the action, which to some extent I can understand, but uh, it is a huge missed opportunity that Altor is uh, is just New York 2.0. What's with a peanut butter? We had a deal. She gets a good grade. You cop for the peanut butter. I heard of that stuff. Never had it, though. See, this is another uh, example of why the Brogan family storylines were, on the whole, the kind of lame. It's like peanut butter. Thanks. That's the plot line for this episode. Get Brogan's daughter a jar of peanut butter. Oh, drama. Will she get the peanut butter? And do we care? A perfect match. Tissue and blood. That voice is driving me crazy. I know that voice. How's the peanut butter hunt coming, Dad? Oh, this is not seriously the subplot, is it? You know, Dad, I've been giving this peanut butter thing a lot of thought. And oh, God, I'm shut up about peanut butter. Do something interesting. It can be smooth or crunchy. Hi. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, um, take off your clothes and join me? And I do remember watching this as a kid and just Always. thinking, oh, no, these scenes oh. are coming and, no, and I can go off and get a drink or make a sandwich or something, no, come back three minutes later, and I won't really have missed anything important so because... It's just chatter. Hey, um, did you have any luck with that peanut butter? Oh, shut up! Shut up! You too. Oh, there is more to science fiction action and adventure than peanut butter. <sighs> oh, damn my need for peanut butter. My enemies know my greatest weakness, peanut butter! At the parking lot in the central hub. Oh man, a limo and two crayons. Oh, Took's uh, third eye open there for uh, seemingly no reason. I don't ever remember seeing that before. The eye usually just opened if she needed to use it to to perform a telekinesis thing. So I wonder if that was the eye malfunctioning. Which is uh, rare, actually, for the animatronics in Space Precinct. I don't generally remember ever seeing any of them malfunction like that. Bottom line. I'm Stephen Burkoff, and I get to do whatever I want. Stay with him, Haldane. Now, this episode, I think, is the first episode to uh, to include that little teddy bear on uh, Castle and Took's uh, cruiser bonnet. And it just got a nice close-up there, uh, illuminated by the lightning. And that was a lovely, simple touch to differentiate between the two vehicles. It also uh, is a nice... I'm doing my best. A nice nod for the two characters that they would uh, would have a little teddy bear like that. And I think we just had a continuity error there where um, the shot of uh, Rick and Pike approaching the dirigible, they had Wurt's body in the back. Is Wurt's body... I thought Wurt was, um, was dead and gone and plundered for organs by this point. This doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. It name's Brogan. He's a cop. Huh. Oh right, so so the two Creons, Rick and um, and Pike, went to collect Stephen Burkoff. They said they were, that's that's what they said they were going to do. Then we saw that shot of them approaching the dirigible with Wirt in the back. Was Wirt meant to be Stephen Burkoff? Did they just slip that in as a very quick quick shot because they forgot to put Stephen Burkoff in the back of the the limo and uh, they thought nobody would notice? I mean, Wirt's bright purple. It, there's no way you couldn't notice that the uh, the previously dead character was uh, suddenly in the back of the car again. I'm not operating on a man unless he's properly sedated. I don't want to risk damaging his heart. It makes me very anxious, and when I'm anxious, I get even more burkoffy than usual, and you don't want me when I'm very burkoffy. Oh, that's a fairly unimpressive end to uh, to Stephen Burkoff in this episode. It's nice that he uh, he joined forces with Brogan at the end there, did the right thing, which is rare for the uh, the villains in Space Precinct to change sides like that. But he just got shot down, and that's him dead on the sofa. Um, no, end of Stephen Burkoff. That's not very impressive. Not a very Burkoff way to go. We we expect better deaths from Stephen Burkoff than just a quick, you know, bang, smash sofa, and he's gone. He needs a proper hammy death, damn it. He's Stephen Burkoff. Getting some lovely shots of the uh, the dirigible here. 
And I also like the interior scenes where the camera is swaying. You get the impression that it is this big floating thing that uh, that people are having difficulty walking on. Uh, Pike is making his escape from the dirigible, and I'm still, I am still looking at this guy and thinking, I recognise him. Whoa. Okay, that is a very cool crash landing shot of the cruiser crashing into the dirigible, and uh, there was even a little model brogan there waiting to jump on. That's quite sweet. Traffic. Go, 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 go. That seemed to be uh, Brogan's catchphrase after a... Uh, I love this job. It was, go, 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 move, 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 move! Which uh, I, I don't think was unique to him. It was more a uh, sort of 80s, 90s uh, action uh, cliché line. This is what we want from Space Precinct. Lots of cruisers flying around, sirens blazing. Ground level. And Pike is now being chased by Orin and Romek. And I'm still looking at him and thinking... I recognise it's something in the face as well, not just the voice and the body language, but... Oh, well, he's dead now. And this explosion, the dirigible going up in flames, is a beautiful shot. Except for the fact that it... I mean, look, the whole city is on fire. In a Thunderbirds episode, that would be like where the story starts. In Space Precinct, it's like, well, we've blown up half the city. Our work here is done. We can go home. There's no consequences to this... Uh, hideously devastating explosion that has to have claimed uh, one or two lives and not just the baddies. Well, now everything has been wrapped up. The uh, organ leggers have been stopped, but we still have one final plot point to clear up. Will Brogan get the peanut butter? I got my sources. And there we have it. We have peanut butter. We have peanut butter! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. How about a peanut butter sandwich? Oh, there we go. See, peanut butter, it brings people together. Peanut butter is the the solution to all of life's problems. And there we are, that was Deadline. Um, not one of my favourite episodes of Space Precinct, but... Uh, certainly an improvement on some of the other earlier episodes and in particular the model effects were great i'm looking at these end credits here and i'm trying to see no there's no credit for um for pike which is really odd um i suppose we could ask uh, richard james since uh, richard james is uh, the co-host one of the co-hosts well no the co-host of this podcast uh with mr jamie anderson and obviously richard james would have been on set when all this was happening um so perhaps Richard James could enlighten us as to uh, just who played Pike, if he could solve the mystery for me, because, uh, like I said, the voice is very familiar, the body language is very familiar, something about the face is very familiar. So, over to you, Mr. Richard James. Can you illuminate for our listeners just who exactly was Pike? At last, Space Precinct makes it onto the randomizer. All about, it's about you. Time. All about you, yes. Richard, isn't it? It's all about me. Particularly that episode, of course, because I did in fact play as well as Officer Orin, mm-hmm. everyone's favourite lanky Creon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I played everyone's second favourite lanky Creon, a character called Pike. Uh, really? Is, is that the... everyone's favourite or second favourite? Second. Really? See, he's the second favourite. Every, everyone's is. second favourite Creon that you played is what you mean. I said everyone's second favourite lanky Creon. Oh, it's quite specific, isn't it? Same thing, <laughs> I think. He was one of the organ harvesters, I think, and I had a yeah. long sort of uh, cigarette holder. Um, oh, here's a story. I think I stole the watch that I wore. Yeah. Another bit of your space precinct thievery. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't you have it anymore, but I did, did wear it for it? a long time. Did you flog it thievery. on eBay or something? No, I didn't flog it. No, I wore it for a long time and I think it just fell apart. Mm. But I had it for a good while. But yes, that was, uh, that was an interesting experience. John Glenn directed that and uh, he yeah. was able to get Stephen Burke off along, of course, ah. to play uh, the villain of the piece, uh, who, who was fantastic. I mean, he was a real hero of mine as I was growing up and through drama school. And it was brilliant to um, be sitting uh, to the side of the stage with him. He would, uh, he would. would. I remember one day he gave me uh, his rendition of the opening soliloquy from Richard III. I've seen Stephen Burkhoff's Richard III. Just for you? Just for me. Amazing. It was extraordinary. Yeah. And I also then met, I can't remember who it was, but many years later, someone who then worked with Stephen Burkhoff and had mentioned to him that, uh, oh, I remember you did Space Precinct. Didn't remember a thing about it. Mm. 
we hear that. I think a lot. that's fair enough. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a couple of days' work for somebody exactly. who's done hundreds and exactly. hundreds of projects. Absolutely. It's the same when people ask him about UFO. He was in UFO as right. well, and he had no, me- yeah. no recollection of it. Yeah, as you say, for him it was two or three days. And I remember him being very upset about the fact that the automatic doors in the set didn't open automatically <laughs> as they did on the Bond movie that he did with John Glenn. Uh, but they had to be uh, pulled open, you know, with a plank of wood and a bit of string. It's a bit but, less uh, glamorous yeah. than you'd expect. Yeah, absolutely right. But yes, Deadline, very interesting uh, interesting story. Yeah, quite a nice one to, to review. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, Chris. Nice. Let's hope for yeah, more brilliant. new series from the Randomizer next week. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and do remember to uh, uh, pop along to uh, whichever uh, platform you're listening us, to us on and review us and rate us and share us and above all subscribe so that you hear every single podcast and every single episode of The Randomizer as it appears every week. That would be lovely. Thank you, please. And do also do a screenshot and share it on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast, and mm. uh, we'll check that you're actually listening to us. Indeed. Uh, final <laughs> comment uh, comes via Podbean. Uh, I don't have a name, but they say, a brilliant Chris Packham interview in Pods 11 and 12. Listen to them on holiday in a caravan in Somerset. How lovely. I'm loving the podcast and also Fab Live on Facebook. Great work, lads. Well, thank you very much, whoever you were. Thank very you. Very nice indeed. Yes, it wasn't yeah. Mr Podbean, was it? it Podbean's it the wasn't. app. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's great. Yeah, so Fab Live is back on the 1st of October, 7 o'clock on the official Jerry Anderson Facebook page. Uh, send anything you'd like to fablive at jerryanderson.co.uk and we will show it. And, uh, well, you've got to be careful because people will comment on it uh, mm. because that's the whole point. Yeah, you've got to be ready for it to go out into the public domain. Yeah, and uh, in the meantime, please do follow all of our Firestorm social media, Firestorm HQ on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, SF9 Firestorm on Twitter. Um, particularly recommend that you head over to the YouTube channel and subscribe there. Uh, nice. It's definitely be worth your while in the coming yes. weeks, I think. Yes. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, mm-hmm. wink. Mm-hmm. Say um, no more. And that's it, really, isn't it, Richard? I think that's about it for today. Again, Jamie. Unless, yeah. let me just check. Uh, yeah. Still recording. I all of that. Yeah, still recording. Well, that's a relief. Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks for doing that all over again. I'm sure nobody could tell that this was the second yeah. attempt. Seamless. <laughs> totally. And, uh, <laughs> well, we'll be see in you next, time. next week. Yeah, see you then. Bye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Have to do now? What am I up to do now? Well, not very much. I think I might go and watch the chase. Actually, the chase. My life Richard. is just one long. You know, it's a life of leisure. That is, I, I love the chase. It's a whole new aspect to you that I didn't. I had well, no very about. often, of course, they have the odd Jerry Anderson-based question they do. on it. So you know, you can't knock it. Uh, which we repeated on Fab Live a little while ago. Didn't yeah, we? What, that's what, right, which yeah. one was that? Big, uh, big rat, was... massive uh, guinea pig or something, wasn't it? That's right, yes, it was, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. But uh, yes, oh, I love the chase. I, I mean, I've actually applied to be on the chase. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. I'd love to be the chaser, actually. You know, they all have nicknames like the Dart Destroyer, the Beast, the Vixen. What would yours be? Oh, I don't know. The, I don't know. The what? I'm trying to think of something that isn't really rude. <laughs> well, you went for Dick Dolphin as your... Uh... <laughs> Dick Dolphin would do. What about the uh, the lanky learner? <laughs> the what? The skinny supremo. <laughs> that would work. Skinny Me and Bradley Su- Walsh. Skinny supremo. Fine. <laughs> All right. I'll look forward to your first appearance on the chase. Yeah, don't hold your breath. <sighs> Best not. Anyway, enjoy that daytime TV watcher. I will. I'll thanks. catch you anon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>